right, so this feels like a bit of a small room for me to start shouting this is something. So just welcome to Computer Science uh, 164. This is meant to be a continuation of sorts of CS50 for those of you who joined us this past fall or in years prior. Indeed, if you don't recall, here is where we last left off. <laughs> <laughs> so now begins part two. So this is meant to be ultimately a class on software engineering in a mobile context. And what does that mean? It means building upon the sorts of things we looked at and learned in CS50, but really taking your abilities and your knowledge of programming and engineering more generally to the next level. And certainly today, almost everyone in this room probably has a mobile device. And this is a new domain in which all sorts of fun, new, interesting problems arrive, among which are the size of these devices, the amount of memory in these devices, the CPU constraints, the network constraints. And so there's all of these uh, computer science challenges that we're now revisiting in this more limited environment. So it's an exciting time both to do web development in this space as well as what we'll call native development. But more on that in just a little bit. So what are the differences between this class and perhaps the one you took prior or a few years back? So ultimately in this course, it's meant to be collaborative between you and a partner. Indeed, as the syllabus says and as the course catalog says, you're hopefully have entered today or will exit uh, today on, this, uh, on the lookout for a partner with whom to take this course. There's relatively few courses um, at the college in which you really do work hands on throughout the semester and it's really key that you find someone with whom you work well. Case in point, I took a class called CS161 when I was an undergrad years ago and I had one of my good buddies um, took this class with me and we had perfect chemistry in terms of personality. We had perfect work habits in terms of who was up when and how we communicated. And so what you really want to be on the lookout for is you think about whether or not to take this course and with whom to take this course, who would you work well with. Um, if you don't have a friend necessarily with whom you could work or that you uh, know is taking the class, we will help. But do enter this course with this mindset because ultimately the course is about engineering larger pieces of software than you did in 50. And whereas 50 was largely you autonomously now the projects will be spec'd in such a way that you just can't or won't want to do each of these projects on your own. And so among the challenges are going to be figuring out how you divvy up the work, how you intercommunicate, and ultimately how you build something more interesting together than you might uh, alone by yourself. So what are the tools and languages that we'll be using in this class? So as the, the course catalog alludes to, we'll be using a palette of languages. Not so much because each of these individual languages are the languages you must or should know, but rather they're going to allow us to explore a lot of the ideas that ultimately underlie the course, those involving uh, design of software and uh, construction of much larger pieces of software. So why these languages in particular? Well, certainly the web doesn't seem to be going anywhere, but we'll look at some of the newer and fancier features of HTML. HTML and they're labeled HTML5. And this isn't just new tags. This is new capabilities that the latest browsers uh, actually have inside of them, including geolocation, the ability to ask the browser programmatically, where is this user geographically, the ability to store data in the user's browser beyond the scope of small, simple cookies, and all sorts of other new features, among them graphics and the like. Um, PHP, because most of you are entering this course, presumably with a background in PHP. And even though this language has grown up, fairly organically over the years, it's now maturing into a language that has a lot of the features that we would like to talk about in this class and that you'll find in other languages still. But undoubtedly, could you explore the same concepts in a class on Ruby or Python or whatever your preferred language happens to be. But we'll also use JavaScript, which has really come into its own. Years ago, being this annoying little language that did little more than trigger pop-ups and redirect you to other pages, now it is the way by which you can make the most dynamic and interesting of sites. And then finally, Objective C, um, which syntactically will probably bend your mind a little bit, um, but ultimately it's a superset of C, the language that you all learn presumably in CS50. And what's nice about this is that much like PHP and JavaScript, it'll allow us to continue the conversation from fall 2011 or prior so that the ideas are new, but a lot of the syntax and a lot of the language details are actually a very natural next step. So with that said, um, how is the course going to work in terms of workload? 
probably going to be as much or more than CS50, but spread out over more time. As we'll discuss in just a little bit, not only will you be working with a partner, we're also going to have、uh, four release cycles, whereby over the course of four weeks, will you have a number of milestones that you need to hit. So, what I think you'll find is that unlike 50, where you pretty much have this constant something to do every week, you're going to have a little more wiggle room over the course of the semester, which isn't to say you can just still postpone it to the very last minute, because now you have to coordinate with another human being who has constraints on his or her time. So, you're going to have to navigate those waters as well. But more on the particulars of projects in just a bit. So, ultimately, this class is about design. And so now I have this opportunity to pick on、uh, that class called CS50, in which we don't necessarily do everything in the best way, partly because we're strapped by the tools that we have. So, case in point, you might recall this snippet of code that we introduced roughly halfway through CS50. And this was in the context of what data structure? Yeah, so this was a linked list. And if you recall, this was our very first example of linked lists. This was the code version of when we had the humans come on stage and point at one another with holding numbers. But this was not, even in version one, the best design. So a struct is just this container in which you can put multiple variables of various types. But pick on this design for a moment. What is bad, perhaps, about this representation of that thing we called node if the goal is to create a linked list? Find fault in this design. Yeah. OK, a y good. So, fundamental to linked lists is their singly linked nature, whereby, yes, you only have to remember one pointer to get from first to last element, but that's also the same problem. You have to start at first and move to last element. So, we talked about big O of n time to search this data structure. Of course, the upside is that we have some dynamism, but here, too, there's also more of an underlying concern I have with the specific implementation. Perfect. Yeah, so besides that, besides the sort of fundamental theoretical constraints on the data structure, I've also literally hard coded in int n. Now, the variable's name is inconsequential, but the data type is rather consequential. So, if I wrote a program that had linked lists and I then wanted to、uh, use my same exact code for maybe a dictionary problem set in which I want a linked list for the purpose of hash tables for representing words, what do I or what did many of you have to go do given this sample code? You have to change it, right? So, minimally, you change int to char star or to an actual array inside of the object or something to that effect. You recompile and you're on your way. But suppose the next day, what you actually want to store is student objects. Well, you can do the same thing. Let me just go into my code. Let me copy, paste, and change,、uh, let me change、uh, int to char or to student. And so now we have version three. But you can imagine now if throughout the rest of your life, anytime you need a linked list, you go back to that first CS50 problem set, do a global find and replace. And recompile, this isn't the best way to engineer a piece of software, right? Ideally, you just want to have a more generic container, something called linked list, inside of which you can put anything you want. And so we could take a step toward this in C. In C, even though we don't talk about it much in 50, there is the notion of a void star pointer, which is a generic pointer, which means it can point at anything, whether it's a student object, an int, a char star, or whatever. But C wasn't really designed with this notion of encapsulation in mind, this ability to Store related data and related functionality together. And so out of C did languages like C arise and Objective C, the last of which we'll look at in, the, at in this particular course. But notice, though, the limitations of what we did here already. Plus, then you have to go ahead and define a student, and a student we hard coded with an ID, a name, and a house. But here, too, feels like there's an opportunity for better design, right? If I wanted to tease apart a student's first name and last name, how would you go about in a data structure in C representing their first and last name? So, two different variables, right? Maybe I call it first, maybe I call it last. Maybe you yourselves did that in your MySQL tables or the like in some final project. But there, too, it feels nicer if I could just have this entity in memory known as a student, and then I could just ask it, what's your first name? What's your last name? What's your full name? What are your initials? Right? There's so many questions, if uninteresting questions, that I could ask about this data structure. And it would be nice if to answer those questions, I didn't have to manually do a whole bunch of messy string concatenation or regular expression. 
expression matching or the like, I can just invoke functions related fundamentally to this object. Or as we'll start to call them in the, the context of what's called object oriented programming methods. Uh, so, another little example that's on this, along the same line. So, this was an earlier P set in 52 where you had to implement uh, searching and sorting for P set 3. Well, in C, there's this very common convention whereby if you want to perform some operation on a data structure, and that data structure in this case is an array of ints, well, that's fine. You write the function and you accept as input that. Data structure. But here, too, we're kind of destined for, to reinvent the wheel because the next time I want to sort student objects or generic char stars or foo objects, I essentially have to copy and paste my sort code, change all of the data types inside of it, and then recompile or redeploy that code. So hopefully, there's a better way there, too. In fact, rather than pass in the data structure so that now the function has to know what it is, what if I could embed that functionality like searching and sorting and naming into the data structure? Itself. And we're going to have momentarily that expressive capability in PHP, JavaScript, and in Objective C. Well, what about this one? Let's pick on this P set. So, this was from which P set? All right, so six, right? So, this was the spell checking assignment. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, this was the spell checking assignment. And here, it was kind of interesting in that we gave you the signature, so to speak, for these various functions check, load, size, and unload. And then you had to implement them. But here, too, each of these four functions was inherently tied to the code base we gave you such that you could never use or reuse your PSET 6 code from CS50 without copying and pasting and changing it around because you didn't make a very very generic or reusable piece of software. Rather, you wrote effectively everything in main. And you didn't modularize your code so that after this class, you could just go and use this as a generic uh, dictionary object for words, for phrases, for any sort of pieces of data, or a hash table more generally. But what this hints at is what we're going to start calling an interface. It turns out with languages like PHP and Objective C and others, you can specify that this data structure will provide you with the following functionality. X Y and Z. And here's what X, Y, and Z return. Here's what they take as arguments. I'm not going to make any claims as to how I implement them underneath the hood. But what we'll find is that structs, or as we'll start calling them classes and objects, can make promises to provide this functionality in a very generic way so that you yourself don't have to keep re engineering this code. How about just a couple of more glimpses? So this was from later in the semester when we started talking about form validation. So we left C behind, we moved to the browser, we used JavaScript, and we had this crazy, ugly syntax, but effective for validating form submission or invalid inputs. But it was fairly tedious to write. But what it did suggest is that there's some kind of hierarchical relationship among something here called document. And at the time, we described document as some kind of global variable, an object, if you will, which is essentially like a struct, but a little more sophisticated in that objects in JavaScript can have not only uh, member variables, or let's call them properties, but also methods or functions built right into them. And so this said, go into the document object, get the forms object inside of it, get the registration object, email object, and then the value field which itself was a string. So if you now translate this back to C, this is like having a struct inside of a struct inside of a struct inside of a struct inside of a struct. And finally, the leaf of that data structure is a raw string. And in this case, the value of that field. So we're, we'll tease apart exactly what these uh, features of this languages are and how we can use them better. Indeed, we can improve upon that significantly by starting to use libraries all the more. So around final project time in 50, we certainly preach the value of APIs and libraries so that you can stand on the shoulders of other people who have written lots of code, who have debugged lots of code so that you can do more interesting things by leveraging their work. And so this is an example of a very popular library called jQuery, which effectively has become the de facto standard for JavaScript, enough so that people often conflate jQuery with JavaScript, which frankly is fine, because it just means that this has made the language all the more easy to, interf uh, to interact with and all the more powerful. Now, even though syntactically it looks a little strange, recall from 50 that dollar sign just means what? So it's just a synonym for an object or a, struct, a special struct called jQuery. And it turns out that in JavaScript, unlike PHP, the dollar sign can be used. And this is an actual character in a function or in a variable. It doesn't have special meaning. So the author of jQuery just decided, oh, this is nice. It's a single symbol. It kind of looks special. Let me just alias it to this much longer word to type, jQuery. And thus was born this very common convention of saying dollar sign, open paren, close paren. And inside of that, 
is just a function's argument. So all this is saying is pass to this global jQuery object, another global object called document, and then start to do some interesting things with that object. Dot ready actually now refers to a function that's going to get called with this other function. And what do we call these nameless functions in 50? So these are like lambda functions. This is a topic that comes up in CS51 as well and in other languages besides JavaScript, but it's a wonderfully, compel uh, wonderfully concise way of defining on the fly a function that you do need once and you do need to exist, but you don't care about giving it a name and polluting your global namespace, so to speak, with lots and lots of functions and variables. Well, lastly here, We had this example where we introduced, albeit with a wave of the hand, these things called exceptions. What are exceptions used for, if you recall, in JavaScript or in other languages? Yeah. Yeah, so they're handling errors, right? In C, and also with a lot of functions in PHP, how do you signify that something bad happened? What do you do normally? If you're a function, And you can't give a correct answer because something went wrong. File not found or unreadable, something bad happened. What do you do? So, nothing, right? You, probably, you at least have to return. And if the function has a return type, you have to return some value. And if the function is supposed to return an int, you have to return an int. But the problem that arises in C and in lots of languages is well, if this function is meant to do math and return a number, well, how am I going to signify an error if 0 might actually be a valid answer or negative 1 might actually be an, an, uh, an actual answer? Now, PHP redressed this by introducing these things called notices and warnings and errors, which even if you never quite understood, Why your code was triggering warnings and notices and errors. It did mean something was bad was happening, but that was sort of a back channel mechanism for the language to say something bad happened in increasing order of severity, notice to warning to error. The first two of which eh, you can ignore, but your code has some issue. Error means fatal error, can't proceed at all. So that's sort of a back channel mechanism, but it's a little messy, right? Almost everyone in this room probably wrote some PHP code, if you took 50, that triggered one or more of these errors. And so it'd be nice if we could catch them. Them more effectively. And so, what these things called exceptions allow you to do is exactly that. Rather than just do something by calling a function, you can instead try to do something. And if anything goes wrong that might otherwise impact the correctness of your program, that function can throw an exception, which is a special object, a special structure that you in your code can catch. So, this simple example here in JavaScript proposes to do exactly that. If for some reason this special thing called an XML HTTP request Object doesn't exist, well, that function call is going to throw an exception. And if I catch it, I can then conclude that, okay, that didn't work. Let me try something else. And in this case, this means if that didn't work, it means you're using Internet Explorer. So we'll try this other mechanism <laughs> instead. So, Where else is, was, is there now room for improvement? So we introduced jQuery not just for form,、uh, form validation and the like, but also in the context of AJAX. And AJAX is certainly all the rage today. In any dynamic website from Facebook to Google to any number of others, they're using AJAX underneath the hood. And just as a quick refresher, what does it mean if a website uses AJAX? Sure. Let's、we'll、have a nice conversation here today. Perfect. It can handle HTTP requests, posts, gets, others without having to reload the whole page. And this allows you to have a much more seamless interface for users rather than having to reload the whole page. So, again, think of your Gmail inbox automatically showing new mail, Facebook status updates automatically appearing, all thanks to AJAX. But notice what's interesting here about、uh, jQuery and more specifically JavaScript. There's a whole lot of curly braces here. And that's because fundamental to JavaScript or quite popular within JavaScript is the use of Objects. And an object really just a struct, but it can have more things than just variables inside of it or properties. But these structures, these、uh, objects induced by open curly brace, close curly brace, allow you to pass around arbitrary. Collections of key value pairs. And so,、uh, a, ve a very famous、uh, computer scientist once said if you could only have one data structure on a desert island, it would be a hash table. And that's because these things are so versatile in that you can store arbitrary combinations of data, keys, and values, even hierarchically, simply by giving them names and associated values. And so, this is hugely compelling in JavaScript. And we saw this in the context of associative arrays in PHP. Well, now let's pick on PSET 7, which in CS50 was CS50 Finance, where you had to implement an e trade like website in HTML and in PHP. So here was a snippet of index.php. And when you were implementing, if you implemented that PSET, you might recall writing 
this code again and again. Or frankly, realistically, you probably did cp index.php space whatever the next file was that you wanted to create. So there was a whole lot of redundancy littered throughout your code. And even if you were wise and you used CSS and you factored everything out into a styles.css file, what we didn't really do or preach in 50 was factoring out even common HTML code. In fact, notice we have head, we have body, we have this top div and a logo, we have close body, close HTML. Those were probably common to every one of your pages for that particular project. And what's the downside of having the same code in multiple files, just to be clear? Yeah? If you ever change it in one instance and you want to change it propagate, you have to change it in every file? Yeah, exactly. It's as simple as that. Like, it's just annoying, if nothing else. And it's also prone to errors, because if you miss just one thing, either aesthetically or functionally, your site's not going to work as intended. And this is why we introduced .css files and .js files, so we could factor that code out. Wouldn't it be nice if we could start to factor out common template code like this in PHP? And indeed, we can. So one of the uh, topics of the course will be design patterns, among them MVC, Model View Controller, which is a common technique for doing exactly that, keeping all of your logic your so-called business logic and sort of the core intelligence of your program in separate files altogether, and then relegating all of the aesthetic stuff like CSS and HTML to templates or other sort of standalone files. And the upside of this is not only can you make updates across the board for your application in just one single place, you can also do neat things like support a desktop browser and a mobile browser and some other third device simply by changing only those templates, only the HTML, only the CSS, but all of the hard work that you put into the site, all of the true like logic, the database calls and the like, can live independently. And so among the themes of the course will be designing your own APIs and sitting down with your partner and deciding with him or her what methods or what functions you're going to implement so that he or she can assume that those functions will exist when his or her code calls those functions. And so we'll be able to divide work much more effectively when it's no longer just one of you, but uh, multiple folks together. So lastly, in PSET 8, we use the Google Earth and the Google Maps API. And Google's JavaScript libraries are really actually illustrative of some of the more advanced things you can do with JavaScript. So JavaScript allows us to do things like this, where in this first line, this is what we'll eventually call a factory pattern, where you have some kind of special global object, dot create point, which apparently is creating a new structure called a point. So you could actually do this with other syntax. We use malloc in C. We use the new operator in JavaScript and also PHP. But this is representative of a design pattern that we'll look at, where if you want to create multiple copies of some kind of object, you can relegate that functionality, functionality to what we'll call a factory. And here is perhaps a very canonical example of what we'll do in most every one of the languages we use this term. We have a variable here at left in JavaScript. We call the, method, uh, the keyword new, which says give me a new chunk of memory and invoke the following function, in this case a marker function, which is uh, designed to look like What's a constructor? Those of you who took APCS or the like in high school might recall from Java constructors and the like. Well, this is a way of implementing that same idea. But as we'll see in JavaScript, there aren't classes per se, but these things called prototypes. But this too will allow us to discuss some other aspects of that language as well. So without further ado, let me pause for a moment and introduce our two courses heads, uh, Rob Bowden and Tommy McWilliam. If you'd like to come up here and say an awkward hello. <laughs> Hi there. So for those of you who don't know me from CS50, uh, my name is Tommy. I just want to emphasize that whether you're coming from CS50 or if you've taken as many CS courses as Rob, um, that you really have a lot to get out of this course because really we're focusing on engineering and skills that can really be applied to any of your side projects or any other CS course that you're going to go on to take here. Uh, so we certainly hope we see you this semester. Hi. <laughs> I'm Rob. Uh, you know, I can't tell you all good work quite yet. But if CS50 was any measure where I was just so impressed by all the projects I saw, then I'm sure when we come back here, however many weeks long a semester is, that I'll be able to stand up here again and just tell you how proud I am of all of you. <laughs> and then structurally, what's in store for us this semester? So, and you will meet, as an aside, the, the, uh, the rest of the team uh, over the course of this week and next. So. 
topics among which we'll explore this week. So abstraction, encapsulation. So these are the buzzwords or really the fundamental、uh, ideas behind a lot of the language features that we're going to really start to take advantage of and appreciate ultimately. Abstraction being this idea of being able to implement, for instance, a linked list that's not hard coded for ints, that's not hard coded for students, but it's just a linked list inside of which you can put any piece of data that you want. And to do that, you encapsulate information. You encapsulate the next pointer. You encapsulate the head of a list potentially. And so So、we'll, these themes will recur as we start to design software better. So we'll look at these ideas of classes, prototypes, and objects, many, some of which you've probably seen in AP Computer Science, if that is your background. But we'll look at it in all sorts of contexts, as well as how it's used dis,、uh, differently in these various languages. We'll look at more sophisticated, object oriented techniques. So, what is first, though, this buzzword of OOP, object oriented programming? It really does boil down to taking structs. To the next level, being able to associate inside of some container not just properties or variables like students' names and IDs and the like, but functionality as well, so that you can build into a linked list or build into an array the searching functionality or the sorting functionality, so that you can build into a student object the give me your first name functionality, give me your initials functionality, so that when you say foo.bar, bar no longer needs to just be a variable, it can actually be a function, otherwise known as a method that you call. So, these words really are synonymous. Function is when you're using procedural programming, like C, where you have no classes and objects. A method is just a function that's inside of, so to speak, an object or a struct. So, more on these buzzwords over time. Polymorphism. Is a fancy way of saying that you can actually have hierarchy among your objects. So you can have, for instance, a human object, and then you can have a、uh, man object and a woman object that both share some common functionality or features, but themselves have disparate characteristics as well. And yet, both man and woman. Are humans. So objects can behave in the same shared way, but you don't have to know in advance whether the object that you have in your array or your linked list or the like is one or the other. You can genericize it as this is an array or a linked list of human objects. And we'll see this more before long. Interfaces. So when I mentioned or picked on the dictionary implementation before, where we said you have to implement check and load and unload and the like, well, an interface is a way of saying my class, my struct, will provide you with. All of this functionality. I don't know how I'm going to do it yet, but I commit to providing this functionality. So, very often throughout the semester, what you'll probably do with your partner is sit down at a whiteboard or chalkboard and decide between each other who's going to implement what, what functions or methods each of you is going to implement, what arguments those methods will take, what the return values will be. Then you'll go back to your respective computers or homes. You don't even need to see each other in theory for the rest of the period until you then to come back together and know that if you've at least implemented what You promise to implement that code should be wireable together. Now, invariably, this is not going to work, right? So, <laughs> not certainly the first time. So, more intercommunication will be necessary, but this is the idea so that when you start to collaborate with folks, you're not going to both work on the same piece of the project. You're going to decide what lines you can draw and just make a commitment to one another to implement that functionality so that the other can depend on it. But what will happen quite often is you realize halfway into the week, halfway into the project, damn, that was not really the best design decision. So, you're going to have to revamp your designs and your interfaces. And what your code looks like, so as to solve some problem that your partner or you didn't even realize that we were going to have until you tripped over it. We'll talk to you in the course about design patterns. So these are buzzwords that are often applied to techniques for writing code. The more you program, especially if you've only been in 50 or just one other course, you'll find yourself over the course of future semesters and even years that you're kind of writing the same kind of code a lot. And you find yourself perhaps solving the same problem again and again. So maybe even you, industrious as you might be, might write some helper file, a file containing all sorts of functions that you find yourself using quite a bit so that you can start. Start reusing that same code. And so, here too, we'll talk about common ways of writing code so that you can solve problems more generally. And not just for this problem, but you can reuse that code for other things.、Um, singletons, factories, one of which I mentioned earlier, observers, these are just a few of the、um, pieces of jargon we'll explore that aren't really fancy things unto themselves. In fact, you might have been writing code that adheres to these patterns already, you just didn't have a word for it. But these patterns typically allow you to expedite solving of 
problems that other folks have already had. So this is something too that will prove invaluable. Bureaucratic though it sounds, writing tests for your own code is hugely valuable, especially as your projects start to grow in size. I mean, even think back to the last CS course you took, whether 50 or 61 or something else, whereby you wrote your project and you think everything was working, you'd ran some tests, but then you went back maybe five minutes before the deadline, changed something, and then a whole bunch of things broke. And your code regressed to some earlier state where not much was actually working. Well, imagine a world in which before you actually resubmit that code, you run a command called test, and your code tells you yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. It does what you expect. So this too will become integral to the process of writing these projects for your own sake and your partners. And because as you start to write dozens and hundreds and even thousands of lines of code, if you make one change over here, testing manually the other 999 lines of code that you wrote to see if you broke something elsewhere is just not something you want, you're going to want to do by hand. And so there's this great comfort you'll start to derive by writing tests for your code so that when you do change something, you don't even have to think about the rest of the code. You can run your test, and if it passes, you know you didn't break anything. Now that too is a bit of a, a lie, right? Because invariably you won't have tested everything you should be testing. But here too is an opportunity. When your partner or when a classmate or when your TF does in fact find some bug or some fault, that's kind of a wake up call like, damn, I should have caught that. But okay, not a problem. Write a short test. And by test, I mean a function that calls your function and examines the output. Is it what you expect it to be? We'll write a new test so that the next time you work on this project or code, you're not going to make that same mistake again because that new test will detect the mistake that you've just made. So this is generally known as uh, unit testing. So we'll also talk in the course about user experience. So this is kind of the silly, sexy term that people use to describe user experience these days. And it really refers to the design of user interfaces and the actual UI that humans interact with. And I do recall fondly from CS50 the past couple of years how we've assigned you the task of critiquing some piece of hardware or software with which you find fault, most of which were uh, within somewhere harvard.edu. Um, but it's that kind of discussion we'll have so as not to just pick on and bash on uh, badly designed software or hardware, but to actually think about what is it that makes that particular tool that you might all be about to use so bad, right? And how can you avoid those same pitfalls? And what can you do better? So we'll be on the lookout throughout the semester for things folks do well and things folks do less well. Performance too. And here's something where the mobile context allows us to have interesting conversations. On a mobile device, even if you're on Wi-Fi, there's typically higher latency, whereby just to start getting that web page to download takes a few more milliseconds, or dare say seconds. And so you can't assume the same seamless interface that a user might have on a really nice broadband connection. So does that mean your user is destined to have a crappy experience on their phone? So not necessarily, right? If you engineer the software right, you can do really fancy things with JavaScript, with Objective-C, with other languages so that you can use caching, save information that you want to be able to access quickly. You can do preemptive requests so that if the user almost always goes from option one to two, why not get both option one and two at the same time so that when he or she clicks option two, voila, you have the data waiting. And so this is what makes some applications for instance, Gmail's web app for the iPhone and Android is really quite good. And it feels pretty zippy because when you hit send, it's not actually sending your mail instantly, especially if you're offline, but it's caching it in some local storage and it's actually sending it off when it has the opportunity. So engineering software um, that's compelling, even in the face of these constraints, is non-trivial. So we'll also talk about some industry standard best practices and the like. So source control. So source control, some of you used whether Git or something else in 50 or some other course, refers to really the process of making automated backups of your own code or really auto, uh, different versions of your own code. And this does not, and Tommy gave a seminar on this this past fall, this does not mean using the CP command ad nauseum to make this is pset1 underscore 2, pset1 underscore 3. Right, and I am guilty of this to date all too often. But the problem with this is that it becomes super hard to find. Where is that version where everything did work? It would be nice if I had annotations within my code so that I know what version this actually was. And once you start working with a partner, right, you're not going to want to be emailing your code back and forth and say, here, download the latest version of my file and test it with yours. Wouldn't it be nice if you could run one command, download automatically his or her code into your own folder, and voila, you now have the fresh copy of everyone's code involved. So we'll look at and use constantly tools like uh, Git, an alternative to which is subversion. Uh, but more on those over time. 
Um, IDEs. So gedit, it's not really an IDE. It's actually not bad, and it's much better than nano if you took 50 a couple of years ago, because it, okay, a few of you did. So because you can at least use the mouse, right, which is a nice advancement over the command line uh, only. But there exist more sophisticated tools, for better or for worse. For instance, we did ship the CS50 appliance last year with Eclipse, but then decided not to use it, because frankly, it's a big piece of slow software that's not all that great to use, but it is incredibly common, incredibly popular. But one IDE that we will use in this class, mostly by necessity, but also um, in a good way, is Xcode, which is actually one of the best IDEs I've used, albeit tied to one platform in particular. But more on platforms in a moment. But we'll look to it, the course, at PHP Frameworks. So the, the feature of coding I alluded to earlier, whereby you factor out your HTML tag, your head tags, maybe even the image tag and logo and the footer tags and the like, you can actually make all of that happen so much more easily by building your application on top of someone else's, which is generally called a framework, which means you get a bunch of functions out of the box that you can then call to make your life easier. And one of the frameworks we'll look at is a very user-friendly one called CodeIgniter for PHP, which will allow you to really just focus on writing one or more templates for web browser or mobile browser that will allow you to emphasize uh, write code, your logic, your business logic inside of special classes called models that are really going to contain the intelligence of your application, and then wire those things together with these other types of entities called uh, controllers, thus the C in MVC. And we'll start looking at that as soon as next week. And we'll also look at a number of JavaScript libraries, among them jQuery and its companion jQuery Mobile, which makes it ever so much easier nowadays to actually make mobile-friendly device, uh, mobile-friendly websites for mobile devices, as well as some fancier tools that allow you to really have interactive experiences, even in a mobile context like Node.js, Socket.io, that allow you to have essentially real-time communications between server and browser without bringing the server to its knees by having hundreds or thousands of users all using your site or your application at once. You might have seen one such uh, usage of these libraries. So if you went to the CS50 Fair this week, uh, this past uh, fall, we whipped up, really in just a night, this application here, thanks to Tommy, that used jQuery Mobile. We pulled in a whole bunch of data data based on the uh, form submissions that the students in 50 made um, describing their projects. And then this is, so part of this is faked. So this is just a screenshot. So I can't actually click on this. But if I do go to the background here, this is a iPhone in a window that comes with this program called Xcode. This is just a link to the Safari browser, specifically going to fair.cs50.net. And what you're able to do is create the illusion of, this is what happens when more than two people try to use wireless in Harvard Hall. Um, <laughs> If you click projects, you can then browse to Android apps. We can go to Ali's app. And voila, here was uh, Ali's app for the CS50 Fair. But notice the transitions that we had between pages. Right? It looks nice. right? It looks reminiscent of Android and iOS. But it's a web browser. And so one of the things you get by using these kinds of libraries is all of that functionality without having to write the low-level JavaScript code that would be involved in taking an image and then sliding it a pixel, and then a pixel, and then a pixel, and then a pixel. And then a pixel. These are not not the interesting problems in life unless what your goal is is to write a library that animates uh, images on the screen. But if you're more interested in implementing a CS50 fair uh, attendance application, well, you just want to leverage these kinds of things. And so we'll look not just at what exists, which in itself is not all that interesting, but how these things have been implemented so that you yourself might integrate with them or build your own. And we'll also look finally at SDKs, software development kits. These are tools that you use, really IDEs and other tool components compilers with which to build actual software. And among the tools we'll look at is Xcode. So Xcode is this sort of free, if you have the right OS, um, copy of an IDE uh, designed by Apple that if we fire it up here, let me go over to Xcode here. Let me start a new project. Let me go here. So new project. So this is, I am using the IDE, Integrated Development Environment, called Xcode. Also installed in my computer is the SDK, Software Development Kit, for iOS, which is the operating system that runs on Apple's hardware. I'm going to go ahead and choose from this generic menu here something called the Single View Application. But we'll come back to this over time. I'm going to just make a program called Hello and hit Next. And what this IDE is going to do for me is really, at the end of the day, just create a new empty file. But it's not quite a new empty file, because what you'll get 
get with IDEs like this is a lot of template code, starting boilerplate code that you're welcome to delete, but it's a little easier typically to start filling in the blanks. Much like early P sets in 50, where we hand you some skeletal code and you start filling in the blanks. Now, I'm not going to even write any code. I'm going to go over to this nib file over here, and there is the beginnings of an amazing iPhone application. I'm going to go ahead and drag a label here. I'm going to go ahead and say, hello world. I'm going to recenter it, give it that fancy feature. And then, this is how easy it is to program these days, I'm going to hit the play button. And then voila, in a few seconds, the IDE has built my code and whew, my first iPhone application. And soon yours. <laughs> Thank you. So, I promise we will do more interesting things than that. And programming for the iPhones is not as simple as dragging and dropping. This isn't really scratch. But if that's your objective, I mean, you might be could sell that for 99 cents. Um, it can uh, facilitate the design of such things. So now structurally for this course. So in lectures, we'll meet just once a week on Mondays, 1 to 3. And the goal of lectures really is to provide you with a mental model for the week and really for the month's project, the concepts that you'll be leveraging, the ideas and techniques. And so in lectures, we'll be introduced once every Monday some new set of ideas that hopefully you can then leverage for the current or for some future project. For the course, there will be four projects uh, divvied up as follows. There will be two staff choice projects, which means we spec them out and specify what you need to implement for us, and two students choice projects, which means exactly that. You get to design and propose your own final, uh, your own project, much like, say, the final project in CS50. Um, the structure of the projects are such that the first two will be web apps, which will mean writing HTML and JavaScript and PHP and the like, so that the output is a web-based application that can play on your own mobile phones, in the simulator that I just pulled up there for iOS, or even in a desktop browser where you can simulate a mobile device, frankly, by just shrinking the screen. In fact, the browser will recommend for development purposes is Chrome. Um, Chrome is built on an open source browser framework called WebKit. And what's nice about this is that WebKit underlies the browsers in Android and iOS. So you get two of the biggest um, two of the biggest players there standardizing essentially on this platform. And so even though we preached Firebug, even though uh, Internet Explorer exists, um, we'll find that we'll get <laughs> a lot of bang for our buck, at least for now, in using Chrome. Um, because its tools are so um, increasingly universal. Um, so for these projects, you'll see the following kind of release cycle. So for each project, there'll be five milestones that you need to meet. So on a Monday, we would release the specification, whether it's do this or uh, propose what you want to do. A couple of days later, you'll submit a proposal, which will be just be a few sentences or paragraphs, which in the case of the staff's choice, you tell us who's going to do what. So you'll have to have a quick caucus over the course of those couple of days and just try to divvy up the work. Who's going to do which pieces of the problems, and you can change that over time. But the idea is to figure out who is going to proceed initially in doing what. A few days later, on the following Monday, a design document and a style guide will be due. So design documents are not going to be some formal thing that we prescribe the format of, but rather whatever process you think will work best for you. Frankly, when I've collaborated with friends on various projects, sometimes we just work at a whiteboard, we take a photograph of it, and bam, that's our design for that piece of the puzzle. And so doing something as, as simple as that and then just uploading it to the equivalent of a Google document so that you and your partner have a common starting point and have made some design decisions in advance that both you and he or she can commit to will help expedite this process. But we'll explain in the first specification exactly what kinds of things you should think about and what kinds of things you should propose. And the goal here especially if you think you're kind of thinking ahead of the game. Oh, well, I'll just write my design document afterward. So I used to do this all the time, right? Back in the day when I took 50, we actually had to write for presets design documents bef uh, and submit them with the problem sets. And I was one of those kids who would write the problem set and then reverse engineer the design document based on the perfect sort of ideas I had from the beginning. But this does not work well for larger programs, and it does not work well when you're working with someone else, right? It's sort of just logical that if you're working with someone else, you kind of have to have that conversation at the beginning, not at the end of the project. And so this will be an opportunity to really start fleshing out the ideas for your project. And what I think you'll sometimes find is you might end up spending more of your time in a room at a whiteboard talking about, debating
debating about how to go about implementing something, writing a pseudocode, whether on a board or in a document, and then spending less time actually implementing it. And in fact, if you've done that, that's a really good thing because it means you sort of fleshed out all of the corner cases, thought through all of the design challenges, and then the coding part is easy because you know exactly what it is you then need to implement. Now, that too is one of those things that, eh, not going to happen that way, most likely the first, maybe even the second, the third, or the fourth time. But that's the ideal to strive for, to spend more time arguing with each other, talking about design, and then less time ultimately coding and debugging. Because indeed, you'll have less, fewer problems to fix if you've thought through all the more. So after the proposal and then design document and style guide, you'll have to release your first beta. And the beta version of your software is meant to be as, as solid and as correct as you think it now is. But a few people will likely disagree because a few days later, on a Wednesday, we'll be due code reviews for multiple classmates. So the design of the class will be such that when you submit the beta version of your code on behalf of you and your partner, so you do work together, you submit the same code, the two of you, um, we will then assign to one or more of your other classmates your code to then review, to bang on and try to find bugs, to critique that why do you have five nested for loops, to point out that it would have been nicer to read this with actual comments, and getting feedback not just from your teaching fellow, but from class classmates who might be better at programming than you, who might be weaker at programming than you, but in both cases will you get the perspectives of people that you might end up um, working with or collaborating with, and indeed even among the programmers who you think are you know, who are they to tell me how to write code? Well, if they're having trouble reading your code, like it's not as good as you think it is, right? If it's not all that readable. And so also will the teaching fellows weigh in with feedback of their own so that then um, by the following Monday, you'll have an opportunity with your partner to retool, to go back and fix the design mistakes that you made or others have dis uh, uh, proposed that you've made and actually improve that so that you can ship your proper version of this a week later. And so this is something we just don't have time for in 50, right? Quite often, where you spend all these hours on your project, you think it's right, or maybe you know it's not quite right, but by the time you get that feedback, we're into the next cycle of another project. In this class, the goal will be to actually ship something that you feel is production quality, and it's not uh, still with bugs, with design flaws, or with stylistic mistakes. So with those five milestones, will we approach each of those four projects? Um, so for partners, um, we will... Uh, uh, ask you with whom you would like to work. And I will say, just from personal experience, it is best if you can find a buddy with whom to take the course or just someone you know who you think you would work well with. They don't have to be stronger than you or weaker than you with regard to programming. It's fine, in fact, if there's a disparity there. But really important, I think, is sort of uh, um, diligence. And is this person going to pull his or her own weight? We will try, as the course's staff, to mitigate the, uh, the issues that invariably arise between someone not pulling their weight. And we will uh, keep that in mind so that if one person finds him, him or herself at a disadvantage, we'll figure out mid-semester how to deal with that so long as you approach us. Because this happens. And I can think of a class in CS that this happened to me years ago. And it's incredibly <laughs> frustrating. But you can do the best you can now to try to ward that off by choosing that person carefully. But if you don't really know anyone in the class, that's fine. There'll be an opportunity next week for us to help pair you with someone. So a word on academic honesty. So in CS50, we sent 21 cases to the ad board this past year, um, which is consistent statistically with past years. So this is to say that there is a line um, that I'd like to think is fairly well defined in the multiple paragraphs of text that appear in the course's syllabus and on every problem set, as well as in this course. But realize in all of these cases, was this line crossed by one or more of the parties? So this is not un excessive collaboration or too much talking at a whiteboard. This was emailed code around, or this was copy-paste. And so that is the line. And you'll see in more precise detail in the syllabus where the line here is. In this course, though, we will embrace the reality that you can learn best, not just from us, and maybe not even from us, but from each other, and by having multiple eyes and minds look at your code. And so even though you'll be submitting your code as part of the beta milestone, after which um, you will be seeing uh, classmates' code and they will be seeing yours, realize that within the syllabus is the specification as to what is then appropriate, and really it will boil down to citation and attribution of those ideas. The goal is to learn from each other. So if you ultimately are reviewing someone's code and you're like, oh my god, this is so much smarter than what I did, the intent is that you will then adopt, not with copy-paste, but the ideas that you're seeing there and actually then improve your code as a result. And because of the pairing process, we'll know exactly um, who's been working with whom so that we can get a sense of exactly 
um, how those ideas are propagating. Now, besides lectures, there'll be uh, labs. So labs will happen um, multiple times during the week. Um, we will finalize these once the TFs know their own schedules and you yours. Labs will be an opportunity for two things. One, hands-on activities, whereby multiple teaching fellows will uh, make a short presentation and then roam throughout the room, where we'll have everyone on laptops, on open desk areas, um, in some rooms on campus. And there'll be opportunities to learn how to do something hands-on, like here's how to make a a flip side view controller in iOS, or here is how to use Git in a useful way, or here's how to use this particular IDE. And then the latter hour of these two hour labs will be opportunities for design consultations and for uh, advice with regard to the projects, whether it's both you and your partner there or just one of you. But the message that we do want to send in this course is that, as we did with the final project in 50, the training wheels are deliberately off. Office hours and help. In this case, CS164.net and email and in person. Our role is no longer so much to help you find bugs. Right? There will come a time very soon, and in fact it's now, where there will not be someone else in life who can help you chase down all of your bugs. Like you are now graduated into the class of folks who know how to find their own bugs, or at least know what tools to use to try to chase down those bugs. So just realize that whereas in 50, especially throughout most of the problem sets, the staff were really there to help you line by line. All right, let's think this through. Let's find the bug. The goal now is that you now have a partner, right? You already have a second pair of eyes that can help you. You'll have through the code review process yet more sets of eyes that can help you. And even though we'll certainly answer questions as they arise, do approach this course. And as much as it is meant to be a software engineering course, that it is not meant to be um, this quite the same experience of 50, but really an opportunity to take your own skills and design capabilities to the next level. So a few final words so that if some of you can go off and shop other classes if you'd like, a word on the nature of the hardware choices. Um, so we could do this kind of course, frankly, with Android, with Windows Mobile, with iOS. The upside of using iOS, I genuinely think, is that it allows us to have a fairly smooth conversation from 50 into this class, um, if only because Objective-C, as you'll find, even though syntactically different, is a superset of C. So we don't have to have some of the same conversations as we once did, but realize all of the ideas we'll explore will be related to um, this and other platforms. So roughly halfway through the semester, when we transition to iOS-based native applications, applications, code that gets compiled and run on these devices, you will need to own or have access to a Mac. Um, we have had uh, Hewitt, uh, Harvard University IT, set up a lab with Lion-based Macs, because the one gotcha is your Mac has to run Lion, and you then have to download for free Xcode 4.2. So more on this in a bit. And in the syllabus and on the FAQs page of the course's website, there are some more details. Um, and unfortunately, this is sort of um, the price we pay for using this particular platform. But we'll do our best to equip you if you don't have. As for the hardware, you don't need to have. But if you want to get your parents to get you something, um, <laughs> now might be the academically most compelling opportunity to do so. But <laughs> But as you saw, a, a simulator exists um, with, so that you won't be at a disadvantage if you don't happen to own the latest and greatest hardware. Now as for books, so no books are required for this class. And indeed, for a lot of CS courses in general, like the web is a pretty good resource. And books tend to be more out of date. But for those of you who do like the support structure of books, and there are some good references here, a quick whirlwind tour of the references that you might find helpful. So on the recommended list is this one, The Mythical Man Month, which is actually a classic text in computer science that is definitely worth a read at some point, whether this semester or in the future, and essentially speaks to the process by which the amount of time and effort in developing large software grows with the number of people involved. One of the takeaways being having lots and lots and lots of programmers actually does not solve work proportionally in the same ratio, but rather can end up slowing the process to some extent. Another classic text by the so-called Gang of Four is this book here, Design Patterns, um, which will explore many of the ideas from. It was published several years ago, so there are newer texts that discuss these same ideas in the context of more modern languages than say just Java, but this too is a classic text if you are an aspiring computer scientist and definitely want to have the right books on your bookshelf. Now more in terms of practicality, this is the best book I've seen among the PHP world for actually learning some of the I don't know what the cover means, to be honest. <laughs> 
um, realize this one's actually out of print, but it is available used. In fact, none of these books are at the coop right now because you can do much better on the internet, to be honest. Um, and a lot of Google previews are available, and some of the books might very well be available through Hollis. But realize that all of these are, um, the, the ISBNs are linked in the course's syllabus. This is one of the better books we've seen for JavaScript and the usage of design patterns. So not just writing JavaScript code, but designing JavaScript-based software. This one here for Objective-C, if you borrow, if you use the um, similar book for C by the same author for CS50, if you like that book, albeit fairly dense read, um, this is a nice companion for the language called Objective-C. And this one, I actually, this is probably my favorite because it has pictures and it's colorful. Um, <laughs> but iOS, at least for me, like it was a lot to wrap my mind around, at least syntactically with Objective-C. And of the enormous number of ridiculously large uh, books on iOS that exist out there, this actually was one of the best. So of all the books for which there are learning curves, Objective-C you might find has the highest, given that we have no experience there, but more experience with PHP and JavaScript. This actually isn't a bad book to leaf through um, or borrow or buy at some point. Um, this one, meanwhile, is about user interfaces. And it's actually nice and small, and it really does just plant the ideas of good design with regard to user experience. So you might want to check out this one as well. And we'll do our best throughout the semester to re uh, recommend specific pages or chapters so that at least you can guide yourself through any of these optional readings. So at the end of the semester, there's this thing called a CIS Design Fair, which is strangely familiar. Um, but this is not a, a replacement for the CS50 Fair, which remains in the fall. And in fact, the CIS Design Fair is meant to bring together students from this class, from CS171 Visualization, CS179 User Interfaces, and other classes in Applied Mathematics and Engineering Sciences, so that on May 1st, later this spring, after you've completed both students' choice and both staff's choice projects, we'll have an opportunity to all gather together and show off what you did in this class and see what classmates did elsewhere. So per the course catalog, we do realize that there might be too few seats, um, at least for now. That, that problem will soon go away, I'm sure. Um, OK, that was funny to me in my head. but. Um, <laughs> Um, but what we will do is this. The only homework for the coming week is to fill out the form here. It is our goal not to lottery the course, but so that we can pull that trigger if need be. Do some time this week, really ASAP, fill out this form. But let me strongly encourage you, as you'll see at the top of that form, um, to try to figure out who your partner would be before filling out the form, because that will just allow for a smoother on-ramping if you decide to proceed with the course. So that's it for today. I and the TFs will stick around for a bit for questions. Otherwise, we will see you on Monday.